How shall I stand before thee but in silence? How shall I honor thee but in the meditation of my heart? Praise and thanksgiving thou seekest not, but the understanding heart thou receivest. I will keep silent before thee, my soul and my spirit and my silence shall be thy dwelling place. Thy spirit shall fill my meditation, and it shall make me and preserve me whole. Strangely enough, it is out of the silence that the presence and the power of God comes. The deeper the silence, the greater the force or power that is felt. Whatever God is, there is one sure thing, that it works silently, almost, one may say, secretly, unseen, unheard. And so it is that in the, the silence of our consciousness, the activity of God, the healing power of God, the supporting and supplying power, the creative power of God comes forth. It is for this reason that in meditation we develop the ability to keep this ear open as if we were listening for something just outside of the ear. Not straining to hear it, because we don't expect to hear with the ear, except the inner ear, but it's that attitude of listening. And uh, in the silence that's created, the still small voice is heard, or the feel, the awareness of God comes in. Now, Health, harmony, wholeness, wisdom, guidance, direction, all of these things come out of the within. They do not come to us from without. They flow out from us, from the within, from the depth of the silence of our inner being. When you feel that contact as if you had tuned in, as if you had made connections inside, when you feel that answering response, you are not merely at one with God. You are at one with every spiritual being and idea throughout the universe. In other words, in making that contact with God, you have made your contact with every person, everything, every place that can possibly have a part in the unfolding of your daily existence. In the human picture, we seem to derive our good just from those around us, from those with whom we have personal contact. But once this spiritual contact is made, people and things throughout the universe become a part of our consciousness, a part of our activity, a part of our daily experience. And wherever there is good for us in the world, it finds its way to us. You will remember John Burroughs, serene I fold my hands and wait, nor care for wind or tide or sea. I rave no more against time and fate, for what is mine will come to me. I shun all haste, I make delays, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amid the eternal ways, and what is mine shall know my face. Asleep, awake, 
by night or day, the friends I seek are seeking me. No wind can blow my bark astray or change the path of destiny. What matter though I stand alone? I wait with joy the coming years. My heart shall reap where it has sown and garner up its fruit of tears. The stars come nightly to the sky. The tides come daily to the sea. Nor time, nor space, nor deep, nor high can keep my own away from me. You know, when you hear beautiful words, ideas like that, you say, why isn't all of that true? Why hasn't it been true in my experience or the experience of my friends or relatives? And I give you the same answer that I did this morning when uh, I reminded you that the good things that are promised you and the evil things that you are told will not come nigh thy dwelling really weren't promised to you at all, but to he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, he that keeps his thought stayed on God. These spiritual things of God, the good things of life, are not for humankind. And the sooner men and women find that out, the better it will be for them. The good things of life, the spiritual things of life, are not for the average man and woman. Why? They're meant for all men and all women. Why can't they come through? Because we do not fulfill the price. Now, as we brought out this morning, the price is keeping mind stayed on God living, moving, having your being in God consciousness, acknowledging God in all your ways. And so with this poem, you say, why is it I've waited a lifetime, my own doesn't come to me, my good doesn't come to me. No, you may wait another lifetime or seven and not have your good come to you unless you fulfill the price. And the price is make your contact with the infinite invisible. Make your conscious oneness, establish your conscious oneness with your God. As a matter of spiritual truth, you are already one with God. Everyone is. That's a relationship that can't be avoided. The man on the gallows is one with God. Every man in prison in the insane asylums and hospitals, they're all one with God. It's of no avail to them until they make this oneness a conscious thing. You remember I have said to you that all the good that will come into your experience must come as the activity of your own consciousness. There's no God can do it for you. No man, no woman, no teacher, no practitioner. They can bring you a healing just as Jesus brought healing for the multitudes, they can bring you a temporary sense of supply as Jesus did to the multitudes. But do you remember that one day the master fed the multitudes and then he went away and went across the lake and the next day the same multitudes took boat, took ship and came over where he was in order to be fed again? And he asked them what they were doing there. Yesterday I fed you. Why are you back here today? Well, we're hungry again. Yes, but I didn't feed you merely to give you food. I fed you to show you a principle of supply, to show you how it's done. If you had learned that principle yesterday, you would never have been hungry today. So it is here. Your practitioner, your teacher can heal you. Never doubt that if your practitioner or teacher is sufficiently spiritually endowed, they can heal you. But of what avail is that to you if you have to come back next week or next month for another healing and next year for another one? The purpose of this work is not to set up a ministry of healers and suppliers. Had Jesus intended that, he would have set up health clinics all across the Holy Land and 
free kitchens. Oh, you know, he could have supplied all the free kitchens in the Holy Land every day without a penny of expense. Wouldn't even have to take up a collection. But he didn't feel that his ministry was feeding people or healing people. His healing and feeding was to show them the principle of life, the spiritual law of life. And unfortunately, they learned to become so dependent on him and on his disciples that he finally had to give up the job and tell them, Oh, Jerusalem, how I would love to have put my arms around you and told you these things. I have still more things to tell you that you cannot bear. If I go not away, the comforter will not come to you. If I, Jesus, don't get out of the way of making your demonstrations, the Christ consciousness will never come to you and do it for you. You'll be so dependent on me that you'll forget that the Christ of me is the Christ of you. And so today we have made the mistake of setting up healing ministries where anybody can telephone or write or come in and ask for a healing and then go on their way waiting until they need the next one. And that's not the purpose of the Christ ministry. The Christ ministry is to heal, support, supply, and sustain you until you become aware of this principle. God is no respecter of persons. No one in this world is endowed with more spirituality than another, potentially. But those who are doing the fine healing works are those who have brought forth, developed, cultivated these spiritual qualities, while the rest leave them later. Never draw on them, just turn to practitioner or teacher. Now, if you wish to bring harmony into your experience as a permanent demonstration, and by that I mean this, if you wish to live by grace, without taking thought, without having to have anxiety for tomorrow's health or tomorrow's supply. If you wish to live by grace so that you do not fear death or old age or decrepitude. If you wish the good of God to flow into your experience, you are the one who must bring it about through establishing your conscious contact with God so that you are uh, equally as aware of God's presence as you are aware of my presence on this platform until God becomes that real to you that you can almost see, hear, taste, touch, and smell God. You are only touching the hem. God is not a word in a Bible, or rather, God is more than a word in a Bible. God is more than a lot of synonyms. God is a lot more than any hymns about God that have ever been written. God is an actual entity, an actual being, an actual presence, just as real as any of us here. And it is possible for us to be as consciously aware of God as we are of each other. And until we become aware of God, consciously aware of the presence and power of God, we're in the realm of talking about. It's just like talking about a million dollars. Might be very satisfying for a little while, but it won't buy anything. Rest assured, talking about God is beautiful too, but it won't produce anything. Talking about God will not produce the fruits of God. God must be felt. God must be realized. God must become an experience. God must become actual in our lives. Then, when you say, I have felt the presence of God, you may then know that the presence of God is going before you to make the crooked places straight. 
you may then know that the presence of God, which is the presence of divine substance, will appear outwardly as dollar bills, as food, clothing, housing, transportation. Once you have felt the presence and power of God, it is easy to repeat that over and over and over again until finally you live constantly in an awareness of this inner being, this inner presence. And as you do, you find that it becomes tangible as friends, as supply, as health, as transportation, as homes, as all of the good things of life. God doesn't send these to us. God is these things. God is the very substance and activity and form. But God, in order for you to have it appear in your experience, must be actual with you. As if you were going to do some modeling and wanted to do some clay figures, you've got everything there but the clay. The answer is that without the clay, there will be no clay figures. And so it is here. We want all of my good to flow to me. We want friends. We want activities, employment, supply, homes, transportation. The only thing that seems to be lacking in the picture is the substance of which these things are formed. And the substance of them is God. God is ever present, but of no avail except in the degree of your conscious awareness of it. That has been the great tragedy in Orthodox religion, that Sunday after Sunday and Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday follow each other, and the preacher gets up and tells the audience, the congregation, about God and about the promises of God and the protection of God. And year follows year, year follows year, sin, disease, death, carry right on, wars, rumors of wars, disaster, volcanoes, earthquakes. Yet all of this time, God is preached in a hundred thousand churches. What is the answer to it? The answer is that God has not become a living reality to the congregation. And therefore, the words of the ministers are, on the whole, fruitless. There was a minister in Boston Brooks, who evidently had this touch of the Christ because it showed forth in a magnificent edifice and uh, evidently the health and harmony of his congregation, so much so that when a sculptor was called in to do a model, to do a, a statue of this minister, all that he could be aware of was this minister standing here with open Bible and right in back of him the figure of Jesus Christ with his hand on Brooks' shoulder. In other words, that man Brooks had the consciousness of God, the consciousness of the presence of the Christ so clearly defined in his own consciousness that when the artist went to do him, that's what he was aware of. The very figure, the very presence of the Master touching that man's shoulder. Now, all of our truth teaching, all of our metaphysics, all of our scientific Christianity is aimed only at one thing, and that is attaining the consciousness of the presence of God. The so-called miracles that it performs of healing and supply, those are merely to show you the principle to show you that this principle is true and encourage you to go forward and attain that mind that was also in Christ Jesus. Now, you know, we were told, even in Scripture, to have that mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought what would happen to you if you really had that mind that was in Christ Jesus? 
Yes, that's exactly what would happen. You'd be standing and people would come from every corner of the globe to hear you talk about God. They would come to you with their troubles and their problems to lay them at your feet and these troubles and problems would disappear. They would bring their sick and bent and broken bodies to you, even their corpses, and have you raise them. Why? Because the mind that was in Christ Jesus can do all of those things. Whether that mind appears in you or me or Jesus, or John or Peter. Do you remember that beautiful story the event that took place at the temple gate, beautiful, the cripple at the gate, John and Peter coming, the cripple begging for alms, and John and Peter saying, silver and gold have I none, such as I have give I unto thee, rise, and so forth. But then, you know, something strange happened. The Hebrews who saw that evidently wanted to put crowns on Peter and John, and their answer was, O oh, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? As if we, of our own understanding or power, had done this thing. It was the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob that performed this healing. It was the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and that will also quicken your mortal body. Think of that. It wasn't only a Hebrew God, it wasn't only a Christian God. Evidently, the Hebrew God and the Christian God were one and the same spirit. And so it is. That mind which was in Christ Jesus was the mind of the Chinese Lao Tse. That same mind appeared as Buddha, Shankara, Jesus the Christ. And all of these men and women of great spiritual illumination, since there is only one spiritual mind. There is only one mind. And uh, as we prepare ourselves for the experience of the attainment, it comes to us by grace, as a gift of God. Now life itself is ours by grace. Be assured you do not have to earn your living by the sweat of your brow. It was never intended that way. And the only reason anyone ever has to do it is because, ignorantly or otherwise, they have withdrawn themselves from the activity of that mind which was also in Christ Jesus. As soon as we catch the very first touch of our oneness with God, life begins to unfold more joyfully, eat more easily, more harmoniously, and certainly with less effort, less labor. As we go on making this contact, feeling this conscious oneness with God, feeling this at one being in tune with the, the infinite, recognizing the infinite invisible as the source of all our visible supply, the relationship becomes closer, the results become better, and gradually we come to that place in consciousness where never again is it necessary to take thought for what we shall eat or drink or wherewithal we shall be clothed or what we shall do tomorrow or where we shall travel tomorrow because we know now that God is living our lives, not we ourselves. Paul caught that so clearly when he said, I live, yet not I. Christ liveth in me. Jesus saw that when he said, the Father within, he doeth the work. The consciousness of a presence, whether you call it Christ or the Father within, or you might use the Hebrew term, God with us, Emmanuel, it makes no difference. You might use the Chinese term. I love that one. That's one of my favorites. That word sings in me over and over and over again. Tao. 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 What is Tao? The word. The presence of God. The consciousness of God. 
that mind that was in Christ Jesus. How? Emmanuel, Christ, the Father within. Any of those terms. But feel it. Feel it within your own being and then you'll find that it lives your life. You don't. You become a beholder of it as it unfolds as your daily experience. Oh, I could point to you to this very edifice and show you a proof of it. Could anything but the grace of God have produced it? Could man's labor have done it? No. Could the love of man for God have done it? No. But the love of God for man did it. Never forget that. It comes by grace. And those who are responsible, who are a part of it, they are merely the vehicles, the instruments through which the presence and power of God is operating. You know, there are bigger cities than Seattle in America, like Chicago, Cleveland. They haven't anything like this. Very sad, but true. You see, it takes spiritual vision. It takes an individual and then surrounded with a little group of individuals who tune in, who feel and have the grace of God and then it works through them and brings all things together for the universal good. It does that in families. It does it in communities. It does it wherever we are open to the grace of God. I wish you could know, I wish I had the gift, the power, to tell you of what it means to live by grace. Never to have to be concerned with tomorrow. Always in the assurance there is, that there is that within me that is bringing about the harmony of my existence, that is drawing unto me all that is necessary for my fulfillment. It's truly a presence that goes before you. It's truly a presence that walks beside you and comes up behind you. Then, as you make room in your consciousness for this awareness, as this presence makes itself felt and known, our lives become merely that that Paul described, watching the Christ live its life as our very being. And there we come to the great subject of what is God? We won't even try to describe God or to tell what God is like since our friend Lao Tse well said that if you could name it, that isn't it. Surely you know that that anything you would say about God would be a form of limitation. You couldn't put infinity and eternality into words. You couldn't put immortality into words. You can't visualize it. Only through an inner developed spiritual consciousness can you know, come to know the presence and power of God. And that doesn't mean that you could tell anybody what God is. You can't. But this you can say, that whatever God is, it is infinite, and whatever God is, it is omnipresent, and whatever God is, it is to be known by its fruit in your experience. Whatever God is, it is to be known through a sense of feeling within you, a sensing within you of a divine presence can't be more exact than that. Sounds vague, sounds indefinite, but it's real. And you can know the reality of it by the fruits in your experience. Now, there is a way to prepare for the realization of God. And first, it is this. Heal yourself of the theological belief that there is a God and you. Try as rapidly as you can to get rid of the superstition that somewhere there is a God. 
it will keep you separated from your goodness. Such beliefs, for the simple reason that whatever God is, we know where God is. The kingdom of God is within you. The reality of God, the presence of God is something and somewhere within reach of your own consciousness. It can't be found outside. The great master warned about that holy temple in Jerusalem. No more shall you worship in this holy mountain nor yet in uh, that great temple in Jerusalem. I guess you could imagine what it would sound like if you told a Catholic they must not look to Rome or a Christian scientist they mustn't look to Boston. Kind of shocking. But the master didn't hesitate. He said it outright. No longer shall you worship in this holy mountain nor yet in that temple that you rebuilt three times over in Jerusalem. You must worship God in spirit and in truth. And the Father takes pleasure in those that worship him in spirit and in truth. Where? Within you. Then we can go to these edifices and we can go to these mountains not to worship God as if they were in the temple or as if they were in the mountains, but in the realization of the omnipresence of God, and we're here in this temple because of its peace and quiet, because it is filled with people like ourselves awaiting the advent of the Holy Ghost, the realization of the Christ within our being. Don't you know that in that silence you had here before I came in, Anything could have happened, and I'm sure many things did happen. You were all together in one place of one mind. And what were you seeking in that silence? Not things, not persons, not prosperity. Just a realization, a touch of the Christ. Well, how could it miss? Keep that up here, day in, day out, week in, week out. Assemble here on your Sundays or on your Thursdays or on your Tuesdays or on your Wednesdays. Come together in love. Come together in adoration of the one spirit permeating all mankind. Be here of, in one place of one mind and come without problem. And come without seeking the solution of problem. And come without desiring to get them. Just come in order to be together with those of your own consciousness and open your consciousness to the realization of the presence of the Christ. And watch in a month, six months, a year, the miracles that take place in this building. Not because God is in this building. Oh, no. This building isn't any holier than the baseball park. It won't sanctify you. You sanctify this building by your presence because the presence of God is where you stand. The place whereon you stand is holy ground. I remember when Lindbergh was flying the Atlantic and uh, there was a baseball game in the afternoon. There was a prize fight at the Yankee Stadium at night. Both of those occasions, the 50-odd thousand people gathered there were told to be still for one minute of prayer for Lindbergh flying the Atlantic. Why, that Yankee Stadium was just as much of a temple, synagogue, church as any edifice there is in the world. And so you come here not to be sanctified, but that you may sanctify it by your presence, that you may gather together in the realization of Christ here and now. Then watch what this edifice, what the people of this organization will do for this community. Miracles will take place. Throngs will come. They always come where there are healings. And then is the time to watch and be alert as that prosperity comes. And remind yourselves that you're not here for loaves and fishes. You're not here to be rebuked as the master rebuked those whom he fed and said, you came here because I fed you yesterday. You saw the miracle and you want it again today. You should have been here 
to learn the principle. So as this prosperity grows through these healings, and the healings come about through your presence, because the place whereon you stand is holy ground, just remember that, not to make of it just a place, a healing clinic, but to make it a place of developing and unfolding and cultivating the consciousness of the presence of God, that the Christ may find outlet in you and through you, and that your lives may be lived by grace. I've been spending a lot of time lately on the subject of grace. There are two articles in some of these Center of Light publications on that subject, grace and more about grace. Since it is only as we receive our health and supply through grace that we come into the ability to live. As long as we have to go about making demonstrations of health and supply, we have no time to live. We're too busy demonstrating. Before that, we were busy making a living. Then we become busy making demonstrations. Let's rise above both of that to the place where we have nothing to do but live and the Christ performs all things for us. Now this Christ, this God, this activity of God or presence of God becomes evident to you and to those who know you through the amount of silence that you develop within yourself. The amount of time you spend at your center is not enough time for the cultivation or development of it. The time that you are at home, when so many families are busy listening to the radio and the love stories going all day, that is some of the time for the cultivation of the spiritual consciousness. The time, so much of the time, that's spent with televisions and other outside activities just takes away from our ability to cultivate a spirit of silence. You can't be watching a television or listening to a radio or a baseball game or football game and developing the spirit of Christ. Well, I'm not saying that we should be ascetics and give up baseball or football or television or radio. But how about putting them in their place? How about giving them a half hour, hour time a day? That's honoring them greatly. Or if we must have it so, let them have one hour. One twenty-fourth ought to be enough. And let's see if we can't give six or eight hours to the development of silence. Not necessarily doing nothing and saying nothing, but an inner style silence that gives us the opportunity to listen for that still small voice. Now, we can do that traveling in our automobiles if we turn the radio off. We can do that in our homes. We can do that even when we're at work. Oh, I know we can because I've done it under all those conditions and I'm no different than anyone else. We can do it by performing whatever we have to do outwardly but keeping this inner ear open inwardly. And in that, we develop, we attain that mind, we come to have that mind which was also in Christ Jesus and then it does for us what it did for the master. Heals us, supplies us, heals the multitude, feeds the multitude, so on down the line. God is not separate or apart from your being. God actually is the substance of which your being is formed. God is the mind of you, the soul of you, the life of you. God is the very activity of your being. As a matter of fact, it is God that is the activity of this body. God, the one life, is the activity of all being and of all body. God, as our poet tells us, is closer than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. Where could that be that's closer than breathing and nearer than hands and feet except the very activity of our own consciousness? So as we begin to understand that and stop praying out, stop praying up, stop looking out and stop looking up, but turn always to that kingdom within, gradually it takes over. Not always at once, but gradually 
we develop the consciousness and it takes over and becomes the activity of our experience. Like everything else in life, it comes with practice. It comes with constancy. It comes with devotion. It's there, eager to come forth, eager to break out and take over in proportion as we stop taking thought about it. God is the very essence of our being. God is the substance of our body. God is the actual substance of all forms. God is the substance of all real existence. God is the activity, the law, the substance, the cause and the effect. That's why your bodies are immortal. That's why your bodies do not have to age or change or die. We only suffer age, change and death because of the acceptance of the universal belief in a material creation. There is no material creation. This entire universe is spiritual. The purpose of our work is not to change the universe or improve it or heal it or save it. This is a spiritual universe made by God, governed by God, maintained and sustained by God. Our purpose in being metaphysicians is to change our concepts of this world, of God and of each other. That is the sole purpose of a spiritual teaching. It is not to heal anybody. There's no one to be healed. God never made anything that needed healing or anyone that needed healing. Our purpose is not to reform or to save or to change. Our purpose in being on this path is to learn to give up the world's erroneous concepts and uh, trade them in for the truth of being. Know the truth about anything and about anybody, and that truth will make you free. Now, of course, the truth is this. Since God is the only causative principle, the only creative principle, all that exists is perfection and harmony. And that means that you exist and I exist at the standpoint of perfection and harmony. Then do we need reforming or changing or healing? No. We need to change that false concept that we've been entertaining of ourselves. We have to stop saying that is Jesus, the son of the carpenter or the son of Mary, and say that is the Christ. We have to stop saying that is Joel, a businessman, or a this, and say that is the Christ of God, the Son of God, joint heir with Christ and God. We have to stop saying of ourselves, of our neighbors, and of our friends, he is this and she is that, because it isn't true. That represents our concepts of them, the world's concepts of them. Actually, God manifests its own being, its own life, as your individual life and mine. Now, when you come in your treatment or prayer to that place where you no longer are reaching out there to heal or change, where you're realizing that this picture that's been presented to you is just an erroneous concept, a universal belief, and that it's up to you to change your concept about it, watch this miracle that takes place. I watched it here all week as Mrs. Holmes worked with her healing basket. Not once did she utter the name of a patient or the name of a disease. Not once did she say, is it a male or a female? Is it rich or poor or white or black? Never once did she ask what's the name or address, what do they look like, or send me a photograph. Never once did she even open the letters to God. Now you might say, how does that treatment reach the specific, that special patient for which it was intended? Mrs. Holmes could tell you that. 
There isn't any such person. There isn't any such patient. As long as you entertain the belief that there is such a person or such a patient, as long as you're playing around with the name of a patient or the name of a disease, you couldn't possibly be a healer. Even if you did accidentally have a healing once in a while. Oh, no. The only healer from the spiritual standpoint isn't delving around in your consciousness. I didn't hear Mrs. Holmes once say, do you think they're jealous or envious or committing adultery? No, she didn't ask that at all. She utterly disregarded the human scene. Do you mind me telling you a secret, Mrs. Holmes? I'm telling the secret of your healing. Huh? There is only one. In that basket, you think there's Joneses and Browns and Smiths and Cancers and Consumptions and all the rest of it, but Mrs. Holmes says, no, there isn't. I'm not interested in what you think is in that basket. I'll tell you what's in that basket. God. God manifested in all its perfection as individual beings. And that's her treatment. She sees as God sees. What? God's own image and likeness. And that's all. And that's all that's to it. And that ought to be an answer to a lot of these metaphysical books that tell you how to treat. How to call the patient by name. And how to find out what the error is that's causing the disease. That ought to be an answer to you. That's completely unnecessary. I made that discovery in 1932 that no patient was ever responsible for their own diseases or discord. I made the discovery for myself, not for the world. Others had discovered it before me. Perhaps Mrs. Holmes knew it years before I did. But for myself, I made the discovery that the error wasn't in my patient's thought. It was a universal belief, more than likely ignorantly and unconsciously accepted by the patient. And that as I beheld God as the life and being, the only life and being, that did the healing work. How did it reach the individual patient? That's interesting. We've been saying all along that God is the only mind. Well, do you know God is my mind? And that you individually exist as an activity and an individuality in my mind. And therefore, any truth that I may know, you immediately know. Because we are the one mind. And the reason that the treatment reaches the patient is, uh, and uh, not the rest of the world, is that the patient has brought themselves consciously into that oneness of mind, or you have brought somebody or some animal or some plant into your consciousness and into the consciousness of the practitioner so that you're consciously one. And there again I come back to what I said, that any good comes into your experience must come through the activity of your consciousness. Now, if you bring yourself into my consciousness, my practitioner consciousness, whatever truth I know is immediately made tangible in your body. Since now, you having come to me, we are not only of one mind, which we always were, but now we're consciously of one mind. And the same way you may bring your dog or your cat or your bird to me. They'll be healed just the same. They don't have to know anything about metaphysical treatment. They don't have to read books or go to church or pray. The mere fact that they are of your consciousness and now you have brought yourself and them to my consciousness they automatically respond. And that is why every name in this healing basket should have their healing since either the patient themselves or someone in whose consciousness the patient is has brought themselves to the consciousness of the practitioner and one with God is a majority. The one person up here who has the vision to say, I'm not interested in those names and dates and places and beliefs since I know that God is one, that life is one individual, infinite, omnipresent, 
you having brought yourself, your friend, your relative, or your animal into that consciousness, automatically they receive the benefit. Do you follow that? It isn't necessary to know error. It is necessary to know the nature of error. And the nature of error is what? A belief, an appearance, an illusion, nothingness, masquerading, claiming to be something. But it only takes one Jesus to dispel the illusion of lack, disease, and death for multitudes. It only takes the realization of one Mrs. Holmes to heal hundreds, thousands. It only takes the consciousness of one practitioner, one teacher, to heal multitudes. Why? One with God is a majority. But there again, Jesus said, do you have faith that I can do this thing? There must be some measure of spiritual yielding on the part of the patient, or at least there should be. A thought hardened with either a dollar sense or an intellectuality sense, the love of learning or position or power, self, ego, inflation, that's a very difficult thought to heal. There really must be and should be a yielding, a recognition that there is something greater than human power, that there is something greater than any power that's visible or tangible to human sense. There must be some kind of a yielding to the fact that, well, you've been closer to God in your realization than I have, you take over. A willingness to give up, a willingness to relax and let go and let the practitioner take over. The person who's still asking for help and holding on to their own problem and doing their own treating is not good to work with. I tell all those who come to me for help, stop your self-treatment, stop your own mental work, drop it. If you want me to take over, let me take over and you stop. Read, oh yes, go to church, go to the center, do anything you like, but don't do it for healing, do it for more enlightenment, more wisdom of God. But for heaven's sake, drop the problem in my lap or I can't help you. If you want to hold on to the problem and me, we don't work well together because I can't work with problems. I can only work with the realization of God's presence and it won't squeeze into the mind already filled with problems and desires to get rid of. There's got to be a little spiritual softness, a little spiritual yielding. And in that consciousness, it goes. I know our old teaching was that the patient should cooperate. It hasn't worked for me, maybe it'll work for other practitioners. But I can only give you the benefit of my practice. It hasn't worked for me. I've had my best results when the patient was willing to say, well, you take over, it's on your shoulder. Of course, I didn't take over humanly, you know that. I didn't take any personal responsibility. All I did was real, and I didn't believe that God or Christ was gonna heal them either. The responsibility was on the shoulders of the truth that there is no such person and no such condition. All of that that appears as sick or sinning man all that that appears as sin, disease, death, lack, and limitation is this mesmeric illusion of sense. If you get fooled by it into becoming a do-gooder, you'll be so hypnotized that you'll have all the troubles of your patients. I've known practitioners to take on the diseases of their patients. You know why? They believed in the reality of the disease. And just as a patient was fighting you to get rid of it, so did the practitioner. And the first thing you know, the blind leading the blind, they both had it. There's only one way to be a healer. That is to understand God as the law, the reality, the substance, the cause, and the effect. And to understand that whatever it is that appears as sin, disease, and death exists only as that appearance or belief or temptation drop it. The faster you drop it, the better it'll be. That makes a healer. And that brings into the uh, activity of your experience the life by grace. Once you stop battling enemies, 
Once you stop battling sin, disease, all the errors of the human world, drop all of that and realize that your life is lived not by might, not by physical might nor by mental power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The moment you realize that, this thing takes over. Out of the silence, out of the depth of the silence within you, it takes over, and the first thing you know, you say, you know, I'm living, but I don't seem to be living at all. It's something else that's living me, something else that's living as me, for me, through me. Something else seems to be determining the issues of my experience. And that something else is God. Whether you ever achieve the ability to describe God or not will make no difference. You will know it by the feel and by the effect. And so it is through the feeling that this awareness must come. The knowledge can come through the mind. That is the knowledge that there is a God and that it's omnipresent where you are, the very place where you stand is holy ground. It is closer to you than breathing, nearer than hands and feet. That, of course, you can get by knowledge. But the actual awareness must come by feel. And that feel is developed as you learn to have periods of quiet, of meditation, of receptivity. And now, In our work, that is, in our infinite way, classes and lectures, in our student work, we encourage, we can't ask or demand, but we encourage our students to have not less than three or four periods of meditation every day. They might be periods in the beginning of just three, four, or five minutes each in the morning before leaving home, probably at noon, on lunch hour, around dinner time and bedtime. If you make a practice of sitting somewhere in your home, office, or washroom just for two or three or four minutes, not taking thought, forget about thoughts, forget about treatments, forget about statements of truth. Just sitting there with this ear open, just two or three minutes, four minutes, then get up and go about your business. You will find that, oh, it'll only be a matter of days or perhaps weeks until you start to get an answer. You start to get some response within you and you'll know that you've touched the hem of the garment. And from then on, you will learn to do what we do Repeat that thing 12 to 20 times a day. And some of those periods for as long as a half hour or an hour. Because you'll find, of course at the present time, you haven't got time for that. But along about the end of the second month, you'll find that you won't be reading newspapers or listening to radios or television, and your movies will be cut down about 90%. And you'll be living in this consciousness of the presence of God and having more joy than you ever had on the outer plane. But that'll come gradually. You can't force it on yourself. All you can do is start with three or four, two, three or four minute periods each day of waiting, of expectancy, of listening, and let it grow on you gradually. Then you'll find that through that, you develop this awareness, this presence. Then, as I say, of your own accord, not being told, but because you can't help yourself, you will be doing it more frequently, and some of the periods will be more prolonged, until ultimately you find yourself actually living and moving and having your being in God consciousness. You'll find, actually, that Christ is living your day and your night. Now, that's the purpose of our work to get out of, not improve the human world. Don't think for a minute that the object of this is to get a better television set, a better automobile. It's to overcome this world so that we may live in an actual realization of God presence, God life, God pleasures, God health, and God supply. 
And then we build really a new world for ourselves. We can truly say that thy kingdom has come upon earth. It really has come into expression in proportion as we learn the great realities of the spiritual kingdom through unfoldment from within. You can't learn it from without. I can tell you my experiences and I can write them for you, but I can't give them to you. That you develop through this meditation work. Now those of you who have copies of that first San Francisco lecture series, please devote some time to the study of meditation because that entire manuscript is my manuscript, my treatise on meditation. It's all that I've learned in all my years of work on meditation. It's been helpful to me, it's been helpful to many of our students, and I think it'll be helpful to many of you. That is the book to use for this purpose. Well, just let me finish by saying this. Don't be satisfied with anything less than a realization of God. Don't be satisfied to have a second-hand God or to have God at second-hand. Have an experience of God yourself. It's a wonderful experience. And once it's begun, you'll never tire of it. Neither will you ever again be able to live without it. Although even after you've attained it, you can lose it if you don't continue in this way. I have seen many people come to great joy and prosperity, spiritual prosperity and health, through this very work, and I've seen them throw it away by getting so involved in the good things that come through this life that they forget the source of the life and go back to their old way of enjoying things instead of the cause of the things. Never think that because you attain the consciousness of God that you will have it forever unless you yourself devote yourself to it. Never doubt for a minute that Peter had many experiences of the presence of God, but he was unable to deny the Master three times. Judas had many experiences of God, and he was able to betray the Master. Oh yes, you can have it and lose it. It's a pearl of great price, and you can't leave it where more than rust corrupt or where the swines can tread upon it. No. When you have this pearl of great price, hide it in the tabernacle of your own being. Keep it there. Don't let the world see it. Just let the world see the fruits of it. You keep it itself hidden within your own silence, your temple of silence, your inner sanctuary of being. Until 10.30 tomorrow morning, bless you.